Thank you for joining us to discuss the ways individuals and policymakers alike are desperately seeking new models for housing. As we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that Laurier's campuses are located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. Perhaps you're joining us from another location, and in that case, I would encourage you to take a moment to honor the Indigenous peoples who have lived, worked, and reside historically and presently where you live. Acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to this land where we live, learn, and work. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of this land and water. I'm Alan Kyan, a realtor at Peak Realty, a lifelong resident of KW, and a Laurier graduate. I will be the moderator for today's panel discussion. Before we get started, I'd like to let everyone know that today's session will be recorded. Also, as great as technology is, sometimes it fails us. For example, the power went out in Sean's building this morning and my internet connection is currently a little unstable. All right, so the format for today is we'll start with hearing from our two panelists, and then we have a conversation about items they have shared or your own questions. Please feel free to pop your questions into the question box and I will pose them to our panelists later. Our panelists for today are Sean Campbell and Dr. Marit Kirst. Sean works as the Executive Director of Union Cooperative, which acquires properties in Waterloo Region for permanent affordability through community ownership. He is also the Principal of Scaled Purpose, a management consultancy for nonprofits, charities, and cooperatives. Marit is an associate professor in Laurier's Department of Psychology and co-director of the Center for Community Research, Learning, and Action. Marit has been involved in evaluations of complex health interventions, including integrated health and social care programs for individuals with complex health care needs and housing programs for individuals experiencing homelessness and serious mental health issues. So to start, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean to begin our presentation. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for the great introduction. Let me just pull up my slides here real quick. Thanks everybody for joining this conversation today. Really important as a community to think about how we address affordability. You know, we think about this often in these abstract terms of affordable housing, but, you know, at this point, it's really housing affordability. It's across the spectrum from the deeply affordable and the supportive housing that we think of often being offered by charities and municipalities for people that uh, face a lot of complex barriers to accessing housing. But we also have artists. We have people who are working at nonprofits. We have folks who are on fixed income and uh, people who are working full-time minimum wage jobs who just can't afford anywhere to live anymore. You know, the, at, the median income for a renter in Waterloo Region is now $57,000 a year. You know, it's becoming increasingly challenging for folks to find an affordable spot to live. So I'll talk a bit about that today. Uh, like Alan, well, I used to say I'm a lifelong resident of Waterloo Region, but it, it got out, I was actually born in Mississauga and came here when I was about six months old. So almost a lifelong resident of Waterloo Region. And it's been really exciting to see all the changes over the last few uh, years in our community as we're, we're growing up. But of course, it's not working the same for everybody. So I'll, I'll show a few slides here that help to paint that picture and then talk about what we're working on at Union Cooperative as one more tool in our community's tool chest to help push back against rising prices gentrification and displacement. Okay, so first up, I'm gonna show a few slides from, um, from KW Community Foundation's Vital Signs Report that came out in the fall. They did a really great job of capturing what's happening in our community right now. So to start with, if we look back in 2005, you see that the average purchase price of a home was about three times the median household income. Fast forward to 2021, we're looking at almost nine times. 
Now, by all accounts, we're, we're probably about a million dollars as the average home price in Warthy region. So it's expanded even more quickly. What I find so important with this slide is we can see that median uh, total household income has become completely disconnected from the rising home prices. Now, one of the impacts that this has, and for folks like myself working on union cooperative who are focused on rental affordability, that means folks who uh, previously would have been able to purchase a single family home are now in the rental market with more disposable income. So it's helping to drive up those rental prices as well, creating more demand for those same units. Most of the purpose-built rental housing stock in Ontario was built before the 1980s. Our very last purpose-built nonprofit housing co-op in Warrior Region was built in the early 1990s. Our communities changed a whole heck of a lot since, uh, since we've really stopped multi-unit rental construction but at the same time now we're seeing more demand for those existing units and demand from folks who are able to pay higher rents. No one's fault. You have to make the choices that make the, the most sense for yourself and your family. But from a systemic perspective, it's now also leading to higher rental rates. And I'll show you that on the next slide here. That between 2008 and 2020, importantly, this is before the COVID-19 bump, uh, the cost of a bachelor unit went from 489 to almost $1,100. Now this is really important because if you receive Ontario Disability Support Program uh, shelter allowance, you get about $490 a month for rent. That's today in 2022. So the last time that a recipient of ODSP shelter allowance could afford a bachelor apartment in our community was 2008. Uh, you know, it's pretty tough to find somewhere that you can afford for $1,100, $1,200 a month when you're only receiving $490 a month. It's making it very difficult for low-income folks in our community. Now, a few important things to note about this graph. I've already mentioned that it's 2020, so that's before the COVID-19 boost. Rental rates have continued to increase. The average cost of a two-bedroom unit is now approaching $1,900 in Kitchener. Um, but importantly, this talks about vacant apartments. So often when we talk about average market rents, you know, those are pulled down by long-term tenants and older units. Here we're looking at what is the cost of a new unit. If you're looking to move, say you're a student who's getting their first job here in Kitchener, you know, what would the cost be for you? What if you're um, someone who's leaving a relationship that's ending or even worse or more significant, a, a bad domestic situation. Um, you know, this is the cost that you'll be paying for a new rental unit. So it's important when we're having these conversations that we don't just talk about the average market rent, but think about the average rent of a vacant apartment. Now, as those rental rates rise, we're seeing more folks apply to the community housing wait list for the region of Waterloo, of people asking for help to access affordable housing. Now, this is a number of years old, 2018. Again, it misses that COVID-19 bump. A few other important things to note about this slide. Uh, one is much like the unemployment rate is it doesn't capture the true need because it can take five to 10 years for somebody who's on this list to then access an affordable unit. So not everybody applies. You also have to go through the process of applying as well, which not everyone may be equipped to do. We're seeing that less and less people are being housed from that waiting list for two reasons. One is it's certainly challenging to build new units, although the region and local charities are doing a fantastic job of building new units. Uh, the region has a goal of building 2,500 new units over the next five years. But also, you know, a, 10 or 15 years ago when we saw on that previous slide, how much more affordable it was to rent a vacant apartment, it's getting harder for people to leave regional and charitable housing, harder for people to move out of shelters, out of affordable housing units, even as uh, the circumstances in their life change. So it's really important that we think uh, about these deeply affordable, supportive housing units, but we also have to think about what is that next step? What is between what's offered by charities in the region and what's offered by the private sector? We're missing that, that gap there. And that's where Union Co-op is hoping to step in as a local solution. We've learned a lot from renewable energy cooperatives like the Community Energy Development Co-op, Life and Trek, all Ontario-based. 
that have raised tens of millions of dollars through the cooperative model to advance affordable housing, or sorry, to advance renewable energy. But we haven't yet seen that same model applied to affordable housing. There are some great examples down in the United States, including the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's a Black-led organization that's using a very similar approach of raising funds through a cooperative to form the down payment to purchase properties. They're pushing back against gentrification, uh, rising rental rates, and ensuring that their community is owning properties within their own community. Now, we think we're the first people in Canada to do this. Um, so it's been really helpful to learn from others and also to have received support from uh, CMHC, United Church of Canada and their EDGE program, uh, Laurier and their Launchpad program, the national bank funds that they have access to as well. Lots of people have pooled their expertise together in order to help build this model. And the way it works as a first step is folks who are interested can join the cooperative as a member. As a co-op, each member gets one equal vote. You can run for the board of directors, make decisions about the properties within your own neighborhood. Step two is members then can, but don't have to invest further in preference shares, which is an investment share in the co-op, uh, earning annual board declared dividends. We can talk more about the mechanics of that after uh, if we have time and, and folks are interested. Really interesting for uh, the future of this model is that you can actually move over existing RSPs that are held, say, at Meridian Credit Union or RBC into the co-op. In the last full census year in 2016, residents of Waterloo Region committed $650 million to their RSPs alone. You know, not money in the bank account or under the mattress, just into our RSPs. So if we can keep even half of 1% of that in the region and apply that towards affordable housing, imagine the impact that we could have. And then the final step is to have a positive impact. So we'll look to hold on to these properties permanently, like a community land trust, removing them from the market speculation. We'll work to renovate the properties over time, but importantly doing so without displacing the current tenants. You know, let's make their lives better as opposed to using uh, renovations as renoviction, as a tool for removing folks. So that's what we're working on right now. We had our first offering documents approved by the provincial regulator last May. We're now up to 175 community members who have invested money in the cooperative. You know, we have really uh, deep hearts of people wearing their hearts on their sleeves here in the community who are looking for ways to get involved and support. And we're happy that the union can be one of those tools alongside the great work of charities and the region of Waterloo as well. Now, as the, the way I'll, I'll kind of close off here is to talk about a few of the types of properties that we're looking at and are particularly concerned about the loss of. One of those um, are what they are sometimes referred to as naturally occurring affordable housing units. These are properties that were not designed to be affordable housing, uh, but they have really long-term tenants. They don't have stainless steel or granite top. They have people who have called these units home for many, many years. We toured one property where a lady lived in the property for 40 years. She raised her daughter in that unit and her daughter now lives on the floor above raising the woman's granddaughter. Another gentleman lived in that property for 30 years. And because of that and rent protections in Ontario for these older units, the landlord can only increase rents by about one to 3% a year as dictated by the province. Uh, so because they stayed so long, the rents were so affordable relative to the market but the units are cheaper than what CMHC, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, would consider as a new purpose-built affordable housing unit. These are the types of units that are increasingly being targeted by investors because of their revenue enhancement strategies or rental uplift potential, the ability of waiting out those existing tenants or using a variety of tactics to encourage them to move on in order to replace them with higher paying tenants. We need to preserve these units or else it creates more downward pressure on the rest of the housing system and removes the ability of folks who are now ready to move on from those more deeply affordable regional and charity uh, units into that middle market, that missing middle. The last piece that we're concerned about, and then I'll hand over the conch here, is uh, our actual purpose-built affordable housing units. We're aware of one portfolio of affordable housing units in our region of 200 purpose-built government-funded affordable housing units 
that were sold last year. Much like a mortgage, uh, the private sector is often provided funding to build affordable housing units if they make a commitment of 20 to 25 years for maintaining affordability. This portfolio was reaching the end of that lifetime. The gentleman who owned it was looking to retire. He put in a lot of effort to try and find someone in the community, community organization to buy it, but there's no organization big enough to buy 200 units. These were stacked townhouses within walking distance of the downtown core. Because the community wasn't set up to buy it, he ultimately, uh, we believe, sold it to, uh, to a private sector investor. Almost certainly these units will be lost. Again, the region has that goal of 200 or 2,500 units over five years. Right here, we just lost 200 units all at once. We need to build a community response to save these naturally occurring affordable housing units and purpose-built affordable housing units when they become available, making sure that we're permanently removing them from the speculative market and bringing them into community ownership. Thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Alan. Thank you for sharing, Sean. That was uh, some great stuff. I can't wait to get into it a little further later on. Uh, if you do have any questions for Sean, feel free to put them in the question box and I'll ask them after Marit speaks. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn things over to Marit to give us her presentation. Thanks so much, Alan. Uh, let me just share my screen here. And my presentation is here, great. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about um, some research that I've been involved in examining a program called Housing First, uh, which is a program that essentially um, tries to address the, the problem of homelessness. Um, and it, it links very much to the discussion that Sean just shared about um, affordable housing and some of the increases with respect to the housing market that we've seen um, in the last few years and how that has implications for this kind of the delivery of this kind of a program. So just a little bit on the issue of homelessness in Canada. Um, housing is a fundamental human right, which is now enshrined in Canadian legislation. Um, but numbers from 2016 with respect to the issue of homelessness show that about two, 235,000 Canadians experience homelessness in a year, uh, 35,000 people on any given night, and actually 20% of people experiencing homelessness are youth. Uh, these data are old. These are old numbers, though. These come from 2016 and don't account for um, our sort of, you know, post-COVID-19 uh, pandemic context when we are going to see significant um, tolls on health and also um, increased housing precarity given the state of the housing market um, in Canada. So um, currently uh, we see a, a really strong focus in the response to the issue of homelessness on emergency response. So uh, a focus on em emergency shelters, um, transitional housing, and a lack of investment in other areas like prevention, uh, programming and services that help to prevent uh, the experience of homelessness, and then also investment in accommodations and supports uh, to, again, prevent uh, homelessness, but then also to address when people are experiencing precarious housing or homelessness. Um, what we do see in the area of investment in accommodation and supports though really tends to follow a more traditional uh, model called a staircase model where people experiencing homelessness um, enter an emergency shelter, uh, then uh, need may enter transitional housing, and then at that point need to kind of meet certain requirements with respect to um, abstinence from substance use or engaging in some sort of treatment in order to gain access to permanent housing. Whereas another model it exists in the Canadian context, and we've done quite a bit of research on its effectiveness called the housing first model, where people are able to skip the emergency shelter and transitional housing steps and move right into permanent housing, as opposed to meeting some sort of prerequisite or determination that deems them you know, ready for access to that housing. 
So the housing first model draws on principles um, by providing people with choice in the kinds of housing that they have access to, um, that they are provided with a set of wraparound health and social services if they need that, um, and that these are very much separate from their access to housing. Um, it's very much focused uh, on a recovery orientation to support people in recovering from um, mental health issues and, or substance use problems. And it takes a harm reduction focus in the sense that it doesn't require people to be abstinent from using substances in order to access housing and, and maintain access to housing and, and social services. So people who are part of Housing First programs uh, have access to a rent supplement um, to support them in being able to pay rent. Um, they also uh, receive help in locating housing of their choice and then also access, um, flexible access to health and social services as part of this program. Um, so the Housing First program was originated in the United States, uh, and a couple of years ago, there was some interest in bringing the Housing First model to Canada, uh, but policymakers wanted to see more evidence of its effectiveness in the Canadian context. So we conducted a large uh, research project uh, that studied it in five different communities. And this was funded, it was called the Anhong Chez Soi project, and it was focused on um, implementing the Housing First model for adults experiencing homelessness and serious mental illness. And it was funded by Health Canada and the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Um, and this was the largest uh, Housing First research project ever conducted in the world. And so the model was a randomized controlled trial uh, with an, a, you know, a really rigorous evaluation component where we collected both quantitative data and we did in-depth interviews with participants to really get a sense of their experiences with the program. And there was a really large sample of participants enrolled in the project. So about 2,148 people were enrolled in the project and those in the Housing First group um, received uh, those components that I mentioned of Housing First and those uh, another set of participants were uh, were receiving access to regular services in the community. So that more staircase oriented model that I mentioned earlier. And the goal was to compare these two groups to see how they improved across a range of outcomes. Um, so this is, uh, you know, we asked a bunch of different questions and, and followed up with people over two years across these various um, factors. Uh, but our, our main focus was on assessing the extent to which participants in the Housing First group would be able to uh, remain stably housed over that two-year uh, period, but then also checking to see if there were improvements um, in health and mental health and other outcomes over that time frame. So what we found through this research was that participants in the Housing First group experienced more days stably housed um, than people in the treatment as usual group who are accessing services through that traditional staircase model over a 24 month period. And so that was a really key uh, indicator of success of this model. But we also heard through doing interviews with our participants, um, and the, these are, uh, this is information from specifically the Toronto site in which I was involved. Um, we uh, spoke with people over at two time points when they entered the study and then after 18 months, and we heard very much that at 18 months, people were experiencing greater control over their lives, greater safety, uh, feeling safer in their, um, in their units, uh, their, their homes. Uh, they had greater hope for the future. They were able to move towards uh, achieving goals and work and education and reconnecting with family and friends uh, and starting new relationships because now they had a home uh, in which to invite people. And we also heard uh, that participants felt that they were seeing improvements with respect to health and mental health. This is just a quote from one of the participants that said, this, uh, this participant said, this is the first time I've had a home, I've had supportive housing before, but I didn't feel safe. And this is the first place that I love to go home to and being safe is a major issue for me. So the implications of this particular research project were pretty significant. Um, so the findings of this, of the At Home Chez project contributed to an investment in Housing First in the federal government's economic action plan in 2013. 
so there was an investment of 600 million over five years to implement Housing First across uh, select communities in Canada. And each of the sites that was involved in the project, most of them continued um, the, the supports for participants in the program uh, beyond just that uh, two year study period. And in Ontario, um, there was continued support for the, uh, the sample in Toronto. And then we also received additional research funding in Toronto to follow up that participant group over six years. And then there was also the development of an implementation toolkit to help other communities who are interested in, in delivering Housing First programs to spread this intervention more widely. What we found in Toronto, um, after six years, we were looking again at housing stability, the extent to which people were able to remain housed over that six year period. And then also if there were improvements in other um, important outcomes. Uh, we found that there was still a significant difference between Housing First participants and those in the traditional uh, treatment as usual group with respect to housing stability. So they, those in the Housing First group remained, um, had more time stably housed than those in the traditional model. And, uh, but we didn't find um, differences in some of the other outcomes like substance use or quality of life, which was interesting. Um, overall, though, based on some of the, the focus of this kind of a program to enhance and ensure housing stability, um, we, the, the pro, there's a lot of growing evidence uh, to demonstrate that this Housing First program is, is effective in helping people to access housing and remain in that housing over time. And cost effectiveness data that has come out of Canada and France recently, uh, because this program has been spread internationally, um, shows that it is cost effective um, and that actually the costs of the program are offset by reductions to other service in other service utilization. So, for example, these cost reductions are a result of decreased psychiatric hospitalizations, outpatient health care, emergency sh shelter stays and incarcerations. So there's cost savings uh, through reductions in use of other services when communities invest in Housing First. We are adapting this model to um, younger age groups. So the original set of services was developed based on an adult uh, population experiencing homelessness. We're now adapting it for younger people, um, age 16 to 24, who are experiencing housing um, precarity or homelessness. And we're currently studying how it works um, in Ontario and BC. And, we're, and the model follows very closely to some of the core principles of Housing First but focused more so on a youth population. And we've learned a lot through um, a lot of evidence on the key things that really facilitate um, delivery of Housing First programs well. So having strong partnerships with community-based services and public health care, um, real, have engaging with great landlords who are supportive of people experiencing homelessness and mental illness and other complex issues. Uh, a commitment to the core principles of Housing First, uh, engaging with staff who have expertise in delivering this kind of program and who really believe in it, and um, making sure that there's investment in developing good staff and client relationships. What we also have seen are significant barriers, though, to the delivery of this kind of a program related to the system itself. Um, so system issues generally persists related to the poor resourcing of Housing First Program. So a lack of support for participants and, and clients who are experiencing complex mental health and substance use problems. Uh, high rental costs, so some of the trends that uh, Sean was talking about, the fact that in many communities, um, we're not seeing enough government investment in these kinds of programs in the sense that the rent supplements are offered are not geared to increasing cost of living that we're seeing, um, especially in this post-pandemic um, period. And then generally a low access to affordable housing really um, creates significant barriers uh, for uh, participants in the program to find accessible housing uh, that will meet their needs, that is safe, and um, that they can afford as part of the program. 
So while we, we do still see an overemphasis in emergency response with respect to the issue of homelessness, um, in order to move more towards supporting prevention of homelessness and increased accommodation and supports for people experiencing homelessness, there's definitely a greater need for it, a government investment in these areas and um, a need to eliminate barriers to accessing supports for people at risk or experiencing homelessness. Uh, greater early intervention for people at risk of homelessness needs to uh, be focused upon and a greater investment in housing stability through the expansion um, while resourcing of programs like Housing First and also addressing the affordable housing crisis. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share some of that research. Uh, again, if we really want to tackle the issue of homelessness, we need to move in some of these directions uh, and address some of the systemic factors that, again, you know, Sean was talking about and, and that um, I've touched on here in order to really address um, the issue of homelessness and increase uh, access to, to this fundamental human right of housing. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, Mara. A lot of great information there. Um, so we're going to get into the questions uh, now. I've seen a, a few pop up throughout. And uh, we'll start off with one that is uh, for both of you. So as we go into the polls in June, what are some of the things to consider when listening to campaign speeches? You know, what are we looking for that's going to help uh, this situation that we're in? Uh, Sean or Mart, whoever wants to go first, go ahead. Now. I, I did the, uh, I have two microphones going and I muted one microphone and had the other one unmuted. Well, thanks for your great question. Um, there's, you know, one of the challenging things with this uh, topic area is that there's almost too much that you can do and it makes it tricky to narrow it down into where you can have the greatest impact. So I'll, I'll identify a few, but certainly there's, there's lots of, of areas to tackle. Um, and there was the, uh, affordable housing task force that just came out with a number of uh, suggestions. There's been lots of comments and commentary around, you know, the balance of, of which ones to focus on. At the provincial level, you know, the province controls the Residential Tenancies Act. It can look at uh, making things more fair for tenants around things like rent eviction. It can reapply rent control for newer apartment buildings. We can have purpose-built uh, rental apartments uh, prioritized again, looking at how the province through Infrastructure Ontario and other lending means can help support community organizations to acquire existing buildings and to build new. We can look at modernizing securities rules for nonprofits and cooperatives, make it easier for community groups to go out and raise money from the community. We can also look at putting on greater restrictions around things like real estate investment trusts of how they're increasingly exploiting the poorest people in our community to maximize return for wealthy investors, including uh, many large funds from all sorts of different parts of the world. Now we can look at having a, a bigger uh, focus on saying, you know, housing is not just a financial asset. It is actually people's homes. And as we're pricing out more people from the purchase of single family homes, we need to look at apartments as permanent homes for people, not as temporary transient um, homes that are really about maximizing financial wealth. Also think that, you know, we are still in a minority uh, situation with the federal government. And there's lots of opportunities for the federal government to also get involved. They control uh, CMHC, which has a, a huge impact on the finance of housing through things like their mortgage loan insurance programs that are set up really well if you're a private sector actor and are really difficult to access if you're a nonprofit charity or co-op. But it fundamentally changes your access to capital. They also control the Income Tax Act, which, uh, you know, REITs don't pay income tax. Co-ops like us, we do. There's all sorts of these different tools. And to start with, we need to start by questioning our fundamental assumptions about what the purpose is of 
uh, housing, particularly rental housing, as more people are being forced to uh, live permanently within the rental housing market. Thank you. Mara, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think that we need to put greater pressure on government at all levels to address this issue and, and to you know truly generate affordable housing. Uh, again, programs like Housing First uh, are, are dependent on access to rental units. And if that is increasingly out of reach for a range of different populations, then we're not going to see this kind of program being delivered. So a commitment amongst candidates to address the issue of housing at all levels and also putting pressure on to fully, you know, really invest in solutions um, to issues on, you know, the end of the, the housing precarity scale um, for people experiencing homelessness and investment in, in programs like Housing First, I think are, are things that we should definitely be looking for um, in, in candidates. Awesome. All right, so to kind of piggyback on that question, uh, you know, each of you have kind of mentioned a, a few examples of programs that are working, examples that are working so far. Um, were there any that you didn't get to touch on in your brief presentation that you want to kind of highlight or maybe elaborate a little bit more on the other programs you've seen that are effective? In Canada, we have a really long tradition of nonprofit and nonprofit cooperative housing organizations that have done a great job of providing permanent and affordable homes. Uh, unfortunately, these organizations have typically relied upon really significant levels of government investment to buy land and build new units. And that largely evaporated in the early 1990s with, uh, with the recession and austerity that came in then. It's the reason why we haven't had a new nonprofit housing co-op built in Warthy region since that time. Now, for us, our response is to say, well, are there new sources of capital, like community investments, uh, redirecting RSPs that folks have into the community for affordable housing? Um, but certainly, there's a huge need and a big opportunity for government to start playing a more active role in saying, well, you know, we already have thousands of cooperative housing units and nonprofit housing units across the region. They're doing a great job. Uh, we see there's a need. You know, how do we work with what already works well, continue to expand that. Um, so I think, you know, as a very starting point, let's look at the tried and true models that are already here. But we're also seeing a lot of great new models, um, both like union co-op, but also community land trusts uh, across Canada as well. Now we operate like a community land trust, but there are some differences there also. Um, Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust in Toronto is one that really inspires me. They do great work. Um, as well as the folks I mentioned before, East Bay Permanent Real Estate Co-op down in the San Francisco Bay Area and the Northeast Investment Cooperative in Minneapolis. Awesome, thank you. Mara, did you have anything you wanted to add there or are you good? I'm good. <laughs> okay, all right, um, so this one kind of follows along the same theme. So uh, we have a question here. I'm a counselor for a small municipality in Eastern Ontario. What tools or strategies would you suggest a municipality can implement slash onboard to help change and implement public policy that stimulates new affordable housing and rental development? So whoever uh, <laughs> thinks they, they can help that out, uh, feel free to, to jump in and with any suggestions. Sure, if it's okay, I can start again. And then Meredith, if you'd like to go next. Um, so I think certainly municipalities have a, a voice that's different than community advocates and community groups that senior levels of government listen to. So I think using your voice and uh, being part of the discussion is really important. You have a great convening authority of being able to bring together different actors as well. Now, one of the advantages of being in a smaller community, sometimes, uh, despite the challenges that, you know, you may not have access to the same financial resources, or, you know, the city of Toronto has a whole team of folks working on housing issues, but you may have greater access to land. And land can be leveraged in, with CMHC programs to build new housing. Um, that's huge. It may really reduce the amount, the, the cost that you need. You may be able to offer some uh, property tax incentives that help nonprofits uh, outcompete the private sector for a similar property. 
uh, or you can potentially look to access Infrastructure Ontario funding or provide uh, loan guarantees that also help nonprofits and cooperatives grow more quickly as well. There are lots of organizations working really hard, um, including the uh, and looking at the Ontario Nonprofit Network and the Ontario Cooperative Association can connect you with folks um, who can help provide uh, different ideas of where to go forward. But it's great that you're attending sessions like this, asking those questions and using your voice. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, with respect to the need to highlighting the need to develop greater affordable housing to address the issue of homelessness, we have a lot of evidence that demonstrates that programs like Housing First can work um, and can really support people and um, move people into permanent housing and out of homelessness. Um, so it's an incredibly valuable strategy uh, to address the issue of homelessness. Um, so incorporating and, and working with evidence can also help to build that argument for the need uh, to address this issue. Um, and, and we definitely have a widespread um, range of evidence for many communities, many municipalities um, to, to share and to build off of, to make this argument and to stimulate these discussions and action. Um, and again, this is incredibly, important to do at the current moment as we are moving out of uh, the pandemic and we're going to see based on the, the state of housing markets, um, housing precarity, um, you know, increasing and increases on health and mental health. So the focus is uh, really, you know, urgent to be addressing this issue um, at all times, but particularly right now. Awesome. Great answer. Thank you. All right. Um, our next question. Are seniors included or excluded uh, by design in either of these approaches? Um, so Union Sustainable Development Cooperative or the Housing First? Um, sorry, question just jumped on me. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, that's, that's the question in general. And then if they are included or excluded, are there any different programs that focus specifically on seniors? Um, with respect to the Housing First uh, program perspective, seniors are not excluded. Uh, there were a number of, of seniors included in uh, the, the project that I mentioned. So it was for, this was designed for adults. Um, and uh, there's been some specific analyses looking at how well this kind of program works for older adults. And there's also been, um, you know, evidence of success for that subpopulation. Um, the extent to which the program has been adapted specifically for seniors at this point, I don't know the extent to which that's happened, but we have seen effectiveness of the program for older adult groups as well. Excellent, thanks. Certainly for union co-op, there's no, no exclusion of, of seniors. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for uh, helping seniors as well, folks who are on fixed income. Um, I think, you know, there are some really neat models that we're seeing people experiment with around the world and being in Wire the Region with uh, three post-secondaries, there's potential opportunities for thinking about the dual challenges of affordable housing for students and affordable housing for seniors. There's models experimenting with uh, buildings that will have graduate students with young kids who need some support, who may be far away from their families and seniors who have lots of expertise, um, who have you know, lived long lives and have that wisdom who can support uh, also with uh, potentially with childcare. Uh, and then they have the support from young families uh, who can help them as well, thinking about how this creates a sense of community as well of affordability. So there's no shortage of, of need and also some really creative solutions of people trying to think not just about how do we bring down the cost, but how do we bring up the standard of living? Awesome. Yeah. And I, I have heard about those programs and they sound like they really help with multiple needs, you know, people that need housing and also seniors that could use the company and support of having someone in their home because they're not ready to leave their home yet. So um, I really am interested in, in programs like that because I seem to, to check two boxes. All right. Um, this next question is for Marit. Um, Often housing systems operate separately from health systems. Bringing those systems together, as in the at-home chez soi model, 
can be challenging, size, systems, privacy, et cetera. Are there any best practices or examples of how best to overcome those challenges? That's a great question. And in a project that I'm currently working on right now that is designed for, um, you know, to implement a housing first program for youth experiencing mental health and substance use problems concurrently, um, we're, we're trying to bring together all of these systems to create better, more integrated mental health and addiction services and bring in housing supports um, to really kind of fully wrap around uh, the, the young person who is experiencing um, a number of, of complex issues. Uh, and uh, best practices are, are basically to have, um, you know, really strong partnerships as, as much as you possibly can build across uh, these different sectors, make sure that everyone really believes in the program um, and that there's effective communication tools so that the sectors um, at the point of care and service delivery can actually communicate with each other and essentially wrap around that that young person or that that client um, and and make sure that they can provide optimal um, care for that that person um, and and I've done I've done research on on these kinds of integrated service um, uh, mechanisms and it's it's very challenging though to, to have all of these different systems that might not have worked together closely before come together and really integrate well. So there needs to be a lot of infrastructure to support that. There needs to be strong leadership and governance to bring partners together and to support and essentially champion um, the bringing together of these different sectors who most often work in, in silos. Um, so it is very challenging work. Uh, and um, as much as I, you know, I'm aware of the best practices to try and implement them and bring all of the partners together um, can still be really challenging, but it, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, and building in that time for those partnerships to be built is, is also really essential for that kind of work. Awesome. All so, right. Oh, ahead, just two no. quick local examples for folks who are interested is House of Friendship is working on shelter care and that just received uh, some funding from the province of Ontario. They took over the uh, old, um, uh, right on Weber and, and University, there's an old hotel there that they took over and they're turning into long-term shelter that also has uh, medical services on staff. And then over the past two years with COVID-19, um, a local charity uh, that, that I, I get to work with every now and then called Sanguine Health Center, they've been providing mobile health care across the shelter system. And that's been funded in part by the region of Waterloo. So some great local examples of, of folks trying to provide different types of care uh, for folks who are um, living in the shelter system. Great. Well, and COVID-19 has also presented a really interesting opportunity to just kind of force um, systems who have worked separately to come together under sort of this crisis situation. And so I think it's, it's advanced a lot of integrated service delivery um, significantly in, in the Waterloo region and in many other communities and regions because it, it just needed to happen. It needed to happen right away. Um, so a lot of the bureaucratic stuff that kind of prevents service integration gets kind of put aside. And as a result, um, you know, clients and, and uh, patients can, can really benefit. Great. All right. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. So we'll try and get to these. Uh, so the next question is, how might communities find or incentivize landlords willing to engage in programs to support individuals experiencing homelessness or living in precarious housing that may be less financially lucrative than offering their units for market rent? I think that's a really great question and definitely having strong landlord relationships is really key to the delivery of programs like Housing First. Um, there are a number of incentives for landlords to participate in a program like this. So um, the rent supplements that are provided typically go right to rent. 
Um, and so it's guaranteed rent for a landlord basically through this kind of a program. Um, there's the incentive to really kind of help address the significant social issue and health issue of homelessness. Um, and there's a lot of work that um, the you know, housing side of the Housing First programs do to really support um, the, the clients coming into the program to, to support them in maintaining their homes um, and also to support the landlord in, in working with, with tenants um, who are part of the program. So there's a lot of infrastructure in place to really kind of support that landlord relationship and um, to make it a positive experience for landlords and tenants uh, through the program. There are a few local examples here as well. So um, HIP Developments is uh, renting units to Reception House to support arriving government-assisted refugees. We have, there's a local uh, real estate investment trust that's leasing units to Thresholds, uh, which supports folks uh, experiencing different mental health barriers. So there are great examples of that happening. And I, I think, you know, despite some of the conversation and my own comments, there's a lot of folks in the private sector working really hard to help make this a better situation as well. Now, there are rent supports and top-ups uh, offered by the region. That's provincial and federal money. Then when there's not enough to go around, there's, there's no more units accessible under that program. So another example of how senior levels of government could provide greater support. You know, one of the big challenges with programs like Ontario Works Welfare and Ontario Disability and their shelter allowance is that they're not geared to inflation. So if you move into a unit that, um, that Alan is offering or, or you know, whoever else, uh, normally every year they're able to increase rents to keep up with inflation. With Ontario Disability and Ontario Shelter, you can't, um, or Ontario Works, you can't do that. So it's eroding the landlord's um, income each year as well. There's no incentive through uh, property taxes or any, anything else. So it really comes down to a landlord saying, well, you know, as Merritt mentioned, is it uh, enough of incentive to know that I have very low vacancy risk if um, if I rent out to low-income people because they don't move often because they have nowhere to go, the rents are so crazy in this community, um, I'm able to collect rent directly from the province and maybe I get a shelter top up and I'm a good person. I want to try and help. But are there other incentives that we could be offering um, to maintain those, those long-term commitments to affordability? Right now, we don't really have them. Mm -hmm. But we should. <laughs> and, and there's definitely examples in the region. So Luth, there's housing first programs in Waterloo region through um, Lutherwood uh, services. And, and they've, you know, engaged with landlords. I think, you know, some of the barriers that they are, are running up against, again, relate to uh, affordable housing stock. Um, and some of the other barriers that, that I mentioned around, um, you know, the ability to resource and support um, clients that have um, more complex needs. Um, but the, these relationships are happening and, and they're amazing and, and so incredibly important to, to Housing First programs, but greater incentives um, are, are very much needed and, and government can definitely help support that. Excellent. All right, so unfortunately we've run out of time for questions. We still do have a lot of questions there. So hopefully um, if, if you two are both okay with it, people can contact you with any questions that didn't get answered during the actual uh, conversation itself. But I did wanna give each of you an opportunity to share your final thoughts uh, on this topic, on this discussion and um, then we'll wrap things up. So uh, why don't we go in reverse order this time? So start with Mart and end with Sean. Um, Mart. I am still muted, sorry. <laughs> Um, I want to say thanks very much for the opportunity and to being invited today. I think these were some great questions and it was great to hear the, the work that, um, you know, that Sean's organization is doing uh, in the region and to really kind of expand the discussion to think about different levels at which we need to increase housing, housing affordability and um, implications on a range of, of different populations. So thank you very much. And again, I'm just going to drop my email in the chat as well, if anybody has any questions. And same for me. It was really great to hear the questions, be part of this conversation. It's so important that folks are taking the time to, to learn more and think about how the, uh, they can advance this in their own lives. 
whether it is a secondary suite or garden suite that they may be able to offer, whether it's a family member or friend who has rental units that they can think differently about how uh, they're providing uh, housing as well. Whether you're looking to sell a property and thinking about selling to a community nonprofit or an organization like Union Co-op. And so fantastic that we have uh, public sector institutions and researchers like Marit as well, who are working on uh, advancing these areas of learning more from other places around the world and seeing what we can bring back. So as we go into the, the election uh, and kind of reopen a, a little bit here, I encourage everyone to keep looking to see what opportunities there are for uh, advancing this, this conversation and reach out if there's ever a way that, um, that we can offer su support. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, I, I want to thank both of you for your presentations as well. I know I learned a great deal today, and um, I think it's going to help me in my actual, you know, professional life as a realtor to be able to share some of this information with uh, my clients, whether they be investors or just looking to do what they can in the community. And I'm sure everyone else has some uh, some people that they can share this information with that will then in turn help others in our community because that's really what it comes down to here is we all want to see our community thrive i think over the past couple of years we've really seen the importance of supporting one another and lifting one another up and these are both great ways that we can do this so really appreciate sharing all the information i hope people have taken away some of the information i know it was a lot of information so there will be a recording of this uh, available um, perhaps sometime next week it will it will come out um, so you can review and kind of absorb the information again uh, and figure out how you can apply it in your own world um, so that being said i want to thank everyone for for joining us today uh, it has been a pleasure speaking with everyone. And um, for our next conversation, it's going to occur on April 7th. And the topic will be international migration in a changing climate, a role for Canada. And so that's the next one that will be coming up in this uh, series. And hopefully you'll join us then.